So the title of this uh, summer summit this year is Data and the Digital Decade. Um, this will be the digital decade and data is absolutely at the heart of it. Today, we'll launch our study uh, on data flows. We will have exciting speakers, uh, Commissioner Reinders, uh, Minister Cedric O, oh, and Minister Karotnik. And it will allow you really to interact with them and ask questions also. Before we start, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening in. We always hope to in, in, enhance many different views on digital and uh, to get the right solutions on the table for the challenges and opportunities that digital creates. So let me hand over to our president of Digital Europe, Hilary Mine from Nokia. The word is yours. Thanks, Cecilia. Welcome to everyone, wherever you're tuning in from. This year's Summer Summit comes at a crucial and really exciting time. U.S. President Biden took off from Brussels just yesterday after a tech-heavy agenda. The transatlantic partnership is the world's largest trade relationship, and we're delighted to see that a permanent forum has been set up to discuss the biggest trade and technology issues. In the EU, the digital policy agenda has never been busier. Significant and long-impacting pieces of legislation have been put forward on artificial intelligence, on the data strategy, on content moderation, and on competition in the digital sphere. And as the title of today's event suggests, this year is also the launch pad for the digital decade, the EU's 10-year strategy to reinvent our society. I'd like to believe that the Commission's target-led approach was inspired by Digital Europe's own 2019 manifesto, which initially set 22 success indicators for Europe. We've added a few more and we're tracking our progress as a continent against these KPIs. Please check these out on our website. Back in 2020, Digital Europe successfully called for a target for digital spending. European leaders responded with around 100 billion, 150 billion euros earmarked for digital spending. And as we speak, the commission is analyzing the national recovery and resilience plans put forward by the member states. And indeed this week, President von der Leyen is traveling to Portugal and Spain to sign off on their national recovery plans. As we called for the target, we feel a responsibility to make sure the money is spent well. That's why in September last year, we launched our digital investment plan for Europe with 10 concrete ideas for pan-European projects. The digital transition will not be successful unless we can bring along all Europeans. So over the last nine months, we have focused a lot of our attention on making sure that citizens can take advantage of the opportunities that technology affords us. Boosting our connectivity, especially in rural areas, and in underserved areas will be a key way to close the digital divide. Another is to ensure that teachers are equipped with the latest technologies and knowledge and that we encourage lifelong learning of digital skills. Today's focus is data. The new oil of the economy, data is central to the digitalized economy. Insights gained from data make business more efficient, can help us reduce emissions, promote healthy and productive lives. To take just two of Digital Europe's KPIs for the digital decade, we believe that 50% of SMEs should be using big data and data should made up, make up 6% of Europe's economy. These are not just numbers we pluck from the air. We know that the digitalized economy grows two and a half times faster than the normal economy and many smaller firms are already taking advantage, but we really need to increase that to ensure we can spread the benefits as widely as possible. In a moment, Cecilia will unveil Digital Europe's latest study, as she mentioned, which focuses on data transfers outside the EU. Since the European Court decision on Privacy Shield, we've led the industry response focused on fact-based analysis. Based on our survey of firms across Europe, this study looks ahead 10 years and envisages two scenarios. One, where we take uh, what we think is the right regulatory path, and another where we continue the current worrying trend towards data protectionism. The study shows that the decisions we make today will have a huge economic impact for many years to come, but I won't take the wind out of uh, Cecilia's sales on that. You'll hear more. I'm glad to say that she'll be joined by one of the EU's leading architects of its privacy policies and the lead negotiator with the US on an update of the Privacy Shield data framework, Commissioner Rangers. They'll discuss the results in more detail as well as the latest AI proposal, and I hope you'll all contribute to that discussion as well. After that, we'll take a deep dive into the world of healthcare where data is a valuable resource for the fight against diseases like COVID-19 and cancer. Led by today's, today's sponsors, Roche, they'll look at what needs to be done in the EU and abroad to harness data's potential. Closing today's event, we'll take a look at the next 12 months. 
We are delighted to be joined by the digital ministers of the next two EU presidencies with Minister Bostin Kurdnik from Slovenia and Minister Cedric O from France. I am very much looking forward to hearing about their plans, both for how they're planning to invest the EU funds at national level, but also their vision for digital policy. We have a lot to discuss. Please, as Cecilia said, please be interactive, leverage the platform. And for now, I will pass back to Cecilia for our exciting new study. Thanks, Cecilia. Thank you so much, and thank you for an excellent speech. So maybe before we start uh, the presentation of our study, I just want to make a few remarks on uh, sometimes we, you know, we work with policy every day, and it seems, you know, that we know everything, and we think that everybody knows everything that's what's going on. Uh, when I came to Brussels four years ago, it was all about the GDPR. It was being launched uh, shortly after. And I remember having a discussion. I said, but there are so many G uh, SMEs and companies and citizens that have no idea this is coming. And one of the responses was, we've been working on this for seven years. If they haven't tapped in by now, they should have done. Uh, I really want to avoid uh, digital Europe and anybody to really thinking that way. People are doing their daily jobs. It's our responsibility to let, to let them know what is going on and what kind of regulations are being done. I am a serious believer that the policymakers does policies to do good. They want to do the right things. It is our obligation to make sure that we understand the consequences that we implement in a way that the world can follow, that companies can innovate and grow in Europe, and that we understand the consequences of decisions uh, before they happen so we don't hamper our economy, our jobs, and our innovation. And this is exactly why we launched a study on the SREMS 2 ruling uh, last year, a study that told us that 90% of the SMEs in Europe transfer data outside Europe. Main destination is US, but many others are also very relevant. 90%. A disruption of our data flows. Unintended, maybe. Intended, maybe. The consequence is the same. Data is the driver of growth in our economies. It is the driver of growth in innovation of health, innovation on manufacturing, innovation on public sector, innovation in all sectors. How do we make sure that these, they, these data do not only benefit local companies, that they benefit scale, that we work together to make sure that these data are leveraged for the benefit of the citizens? at the same time that we safeguard, of course, our privacy and rights of having a personal life and to protect our data. This is not easy. Private sector has globalized, government hasn't. So how do we make sure that we work together to solve these issues, that we make sure that citizens all over the world can have the benefits of the data-driven growth, of the innovations, that we don't disrupt the innovation that already happened in the, in the private sector and the globalization that already happened in the private sector. At the same time, as we do this in a way that we know that we are treat, treating our citizens with the res respect and privacy that they deserve. Not an easy task, but it is doable. And we are looking in the study at how to make sure that we can implement and use GDPR as it is intended it was intended, our data transfer mechanism within the GDPR, to benefit this data growth at the same time as aligning with our major trading partners. So let me go uh, into the study. Uh, background is that we had a SREMS tool ruling. We um, saw uh, data, uh, data, data flows being disrupted. The interpretation of the GDPR was is stricter and it's still not finished, but we're working on the data protection boards are working on it. How do we make sure that the interpretation actually leverages the data flows while safeguarding the protections? I mean, right now we are recovering from the COVID. Disruption will have severe consequences for our economies and especially for Europe. We know that 86% of the growth that will be generated in Europe or by European uh, companies will be done outside Europe. Our companies are global, small as big. So let me take you through uh, and reveal some of the, the findings of our study. 
So our new uh, uh, study is called Data Flows and the Digital Decade. It's conducted by um, Frontier Economics, and it shows that Europe could be two trillion better off and gain two million new jobs by 2030 if we might make the right decisions now. In our negative scenario, most of the pain would be self-inflicted. All sectors and countries and company sizes will rely on these data transfers. This is not a problem of tech companies. If you look at our manufacturing sector, our health sector, our service sector, they are all data driven today. So their dependency right now on transferring data is crucial for the business, their revenue, their profits, for taxes in Europe and many other things. Now, if we look at the numbers of the study, um, we play with two scenarios. First, the negative scenarios, we stand to lose 1.3 trillion in GDP and 1.3 million jobs. In the opt optimistic scenario, we stand to gain 700 billion in GDP. The difference between this is 2 trillion. It is the size of the Italian economy. In the negative scenario, we look at a situation where the GDPR transfer mechanism is not used as it was intended. And this con uh, the standard contractual clauses, which is the contracts that you use for data transfers, um, are not safeguarded to be used by companies. Also, uh, we are looking at a scenario where our major trading partners will increase the data protectionism, data localization, as a response of what we are doing in Europe or as a response to their own protectionism. This is actually a realistic scenario. We are big believers in GDPR. We support GDPR, but we also want GDPR to be an enabler of the economy, being uh, the, an enabler of protection, uh, protecting citizens and their data, while also letting data flow secure and safe across border. And we have mechanisms for that in place now. We need to find out how we can make this happen, not how we can not make this happen. The optimistic scenario, we safeguard the GDPR as it was intended uh, for the data transfer mechanisms, and we find an agreement on WTO level on data flows. Why is this important? WTO is the only um, fora where we can actually do rule-based tr trade agreements. So it's very important to start the dialogues in the WTO on how we can actually create a common framework, not only between EU and US, but also between many other partners in the world on data protectionism. We have a very good role model. We have data adequacy with a number of countries, amongst others, Japan, where we have full data adequacy and we can transfer data freely across border. This has created a tremendous increase in trade and in prosperity in both of the countries. In that agreement, there has been a trilogue dialogue between industry, the government of Japan, and the EU. We have really been into the detail of how this can happen and what the consequences are, into the legal specificities, and I really hope that this will happen for a, a general data uh, transfer mechanism also. So let's look at um, the pain points. Um, we actually know now that around 60% of the losses would be actually, you could say, self-inflicted, or you could say our own fault. We have extremely good protection laws on data flows, but we also have mechanisms that can inspire the rest of the world, and we need to find out what are the differences in their systems that we need to address. Companies are transferring data on daily basis, and we are using protection mechanisms. Those need to be enhanced, described, and we need to make sure that we can continue to use them. There is no company that wishes for the data not to be safe in their hands. And let's remember, the majority of data is industrial data. Data on machine performance, 
predictive maintenance, and many other things. These data also needs to uh, free, uh, um, be transferred freely across border. So we have huge benefits to gain from the WTO negotiations on data transfers. And US and China are actually our biggest data trading partners. One might be easier than the other to find a solution on, but we definitely need to start now. So let's look at who is actually reliant on data. Many would say, well, you know, it's technology companies, but this is actually not at all true. Manufacturing will be, the manufacturing sector will be the sector that will be hit the hardest. We know that in absolute terms, they will be losing around 60 billions of revenue um, by, if we have a disruption of the data flows. Also, of course, ICT, media, culture, and business services, finance, telecom, stands to lose 10% of their exports. And not least, in a continent full of SMEs, export by SMEs could be hit by 14 billion. So, just uh, all in all, we all stand to lose from not collaborating. Business is global. Please work with us policymakers to make sure that we can find a solution on this very complex issue. We need you to be acting as one team on our behalf. So, uh, I think I will jump the slide. I think I have said it. But just to uh, go to some final conclusions. As I said, WTO is the place where we can bring all the players on board to have the same rules. And data protectionism and data localization might be hard to understand. But we have seen how a data-driven growth economy and innovation across border can benefit us all. We need an, to enhance GDPR. We need to enhance the mechanisms that we have. We want to safeguard that data, but remember business to business transfers is all the way hampering us for internal communication, communication with our customers, our clients, our partners abroad. And we really need to solve this problem urgently. Of course, we need to focus on an agreement with the US and it is our major trading partner and, and data transfer partner. And I think we are on it the way. I want to thank uh, Secretary of State Raimondo, uh, and I want to uh, thank uh, Vestager for taking a personal leadership in finding these solutions, and not least also, of course, Commissioner Reinders, who will visit us in a minute here for being the chief negotiator and leader of finding a solution on the data flows, but also many other digital issues in the digital decade. Thank you.